James couldn't even manage simple tasks around the house, so he suggested we should just end our marriage. James mentioned casually, a smug expression on his face, as he stepped into the hospital room where I lay. I was hooked up to several medical machines, and there was a woman next to him whom I had never seen before. Little did James realize, I had amassed a fortune worth $10 million, making a divorce not just a personal turning point, but potentially a life-saving escape for someone like me, who had been merely a homemaker until now. All right, if that's what you want, I silently consented. Staying married to someone who resorted to mocking his partner, especially when they were vulnerable and unwell, was unthinkable. I dug into my bag, retrieved the divorce papers I had the foresight to keep on hand, and presented them to James with a smile. He took them, clearly pleased with himself. Now I can leave you behind. I'll be happier with her, so don't fret, James declared, looping his arm around the woman, introduced as Sophia Lauren. She gave me a disdainful look and mockingly wished me well, now addressing me as if I had lost my status upon their departure. They left the room in high spirits, but their joy was fleeting. Left alone, I couldn't suppress a loud laugh. It was Friday, meaning the divorce would be finalized by Monday. The anticipation of freedom in just three days was exhilarating. My name is Mary Forleo, a 51-year-old homemaker from a modest farming background. Although I had no special talents, I took great pride in my extensive knowledge of cooking. James, my husband of the same age and a college peer, and I had both moved to Kansas City from our rural homes. Living by ourselves, I often prepared various meals for James using produce and rice from my family's farm. Many believed I had won his affection through his James Satch, and I was conscious of this. Indeed, James has always been helpless with household tasks. Since our dating days and throughout our marriage, I had been the one taking care of him. I took care of all our home responsibilities, but sadly James and I never had children. Despite this, we found joy in our life together, bonding over our love for food. On his days off, we'd often go on short road trips, seeking out delicious meals to share. Initially, James was gentle and kind, but around five years into our marriage, his behavior shifted. He became more controlling. While he never became physically abusive, his words grew harsh, often leaving me hurt. Feeling powerless as a full-time homemaker, I rarely stood up to him, doubting he would listen or value my perspective. James landed a job at a prestigious company after college, but left seven years later. He hopped from one job to another, leaving us in a constant state of financial instability. However, at his most recent job, where he stayed for four years, things seemed different. He got along with his coworkers, and I harbor a small hope he might stick it out. Then, one day, James came home early, announcing he had quit his job yet again. My shock slipped out, causing his temper to flare. I dropped everything to appease him, apologizing for my reaction. James's mood was volatile, and I tread carefully to avoid worsening it. After muttering an apology, which seemed to calm him slightly, I resumed my role, serving him dinner and drinks without further comment. Over the years, my identity had faded. Married at 32, now 17 years later, I seldom showed my true self, instead playing the part of the compliant wife to keep the peace. After James had his fill and fell asleep on the couch, I cleaned up the mess he'd left behind feeling a wave of sadness over the state of our marriage. This wasn't the life I had dreamed of. Looking back on our happier moments, I questioned whether continuing this way was bearable. The thought of divorce, once unimaginable, now seemed like a potential escape from this cycle of unhappiness. I began to plan my next day with a newfound resolve, ready to face the challenges I had long ignored. As James set off to the employment office, Securing yet another job with remarkable speed, I made my way to the city office. There, I filled out and signed divorce papers, although I wasn't fully prepared to file them just yet. Holding onto them gave me a sense of security. I carefully hid the signed documents in a deep corner of my bag that I used often, 
wary of the potential fallout should James stumble upon them. Where did you disappear to while I was out looking for jobs? James inquired when I got back. I told him I had been to the stationery store to pick up some resume papers, thinking he might need them. James seemed pleasantly surprised by my thoughtfulness, his initial suspicion quickly replaced by a lighter mood. I handed him the resumes I had actually purchased, and shortly after, he left to meet a friend for drinks, excited about his new job. This position promised a stable salary and benefits superior to any he had before. Silently, I hoped this job would be the one he kept until retirement, especially since it involved sales and required him to spend evenings out more frequently. I treasured these moments of solitude, using them to recharge and always making sure to welcome James with a smile upon his return. Then, unexpectedly, I received a call from my mother. She excitedly shared news of a sudden windfall, $10 million from the value of family land we never thought we needed. The land was appraised at $12 million, and we could live comfortably with just a fraction of that. My mother, who had always been wary of James, especially after he became more possessive and even barred me from visiting my childhood home, suggested it was time for me to reconsider my life choices. She revealed that she had transferred the property, inherited from my grandmother, into my name to avoid inheritance taxes, providing me with an unexpected path to freedom. About a week later, I found myself in the aftermath of a traffic accident. Thankfully, my life was not in danger, but I would need to stay in the hospital for a week. After securing my belongings, including the divorce papers, in the hospital room's drawer, I contacted James to inform him of the accident. His first reaction was not concern for my well-being, but worry over who would prepare his meals during my hospital stay. This response further cemented my realization that my journey toward independence, fueled by my inheritance and the silent preparation of divorce papers, was not only necessary but imminent. I was on the brink of confronting James for valuing his meals over my well-being when I broke the news to him that I'd be hospitalized for a week. Apologizing, I suggested he find his meals elsewhere during my hospital stay. His reaction was anything but supportive. Not even cooking for your own husband, what a lazy wife, he complained, before declaring he was on his way to the hospital. I had originally intended to discuss the inheritance with him that very night, but his response made me reconsider. As I lay in my hospital bed, hooked up to machines and undergoing various tests, I couldn't shake the feeling that my gut instinct about keeping the inheritance a secret was right. When James arrived, his harsh words stung deeply. Standing there with a smirk, he criticized my inability to manage household tasks even in my condition, and suggested a divorce, demanding compensation. Next to him was a woman I didn't recognize, oblivious to the fact that I was worth $10 million. He didn't understand that for me, a divorce wasn't just an end to our marriage, but a crucial turning point. Finally, I resolved to end it. Confronting a man who could so callously insult his wife while she was vulnerable was not something I could tolerate. I handed him the divorce papers I had secretly prepared, watching as his smirk widened. Now I can leave you behind. I'll be happier with her, he claimed, putting his arm around the girl he called Hannah. As they mockingly bid me farewell and left, laughing, I couldn't help but laugh myself. It was Friday, and the divorce would be processed by Monday. The thought of being free in just three days filled me with anticipation. The weekend passed quietly without a word from James, offering me a peace I hadn't felt in a long time, despite the restlessness from inactivity. Whenever I felt agitated, the nurses would encourage me to stay calm. By Monday evening, my phone began to incessantly ring with calls from James. Initially, I ignored them, but after half an hour of relentless ringing, I decided to pick up curious about what he could possibly have to say after everything that had transpired. Upon answering James's persistent calls, his immediate shouting couldn't help but draw a laugh from me, which only fueled his fury further. 
he was irate that the divorce papers hadn't gone through as he expected. I couldn't resist chuckling as I informed him that I had preemptively filed a notice of non-acceptance, recalling how he used to casually threaten divorce during our arguments. I thought it best to safeguard against his impulsive decisions. James, flustered, demanded I withdraw the notice immediately. However, I stood firm, asserting my newfound resolve not to bend to his every whim. I calmly explained that any changes couldn't be made until after my hospital discharge, and even then, we would have to navigate the official procedures together at the municipal office. James's desperation, especially his eagerness to formalize his relationship with Hannah, whom he introduced as his new partner during my hospitalization, was both appalling and amusing. When I inquired if Hannah was the woman he intended to marry, James's confirmation only highlighted the absurdity of his situation. Since we were still legally married, Hannah was, in essence, his mistress. I maintained my composure in the face of James's irrationality, further agitating him by indicating that the division of our assets, including the complications arising from his actions, would be handled by my lawyer. I reminded him that I had diligently managed our home and remained faithful, placing the responsibility of our failed marriage squarely on his shoulders. James seemed confused, wrongly assuming that my inability to perform household duties while hospitalized constituted neglect on my part. I patiently explained that his failure to care for me and his expectation that I should cater to his needs despite my condition was unreasonable. Not only was it neglectful, but as an adult, he should be capable of managing his own affairs. James's attempts to justify his behavior with flawed logic were bewildering. He clung to the belief that his relationship with Hannah absolved him of any wrongdoing, dismissing the fact that his affair was a clear breach of our marriage vows. Despite his stubborn insistence, it was evident that his arguments would hold no water in any reasonable discussion, let alone in legal proceedings. His inability to grasp the gravity of his actions and the legal and moral implications of cheating was astounding, revealing just how diluted his perspective had become. Choosing to put an end to the unproductive exchange, I informed James that any further communication should be conducted through our lawyers. Cutting the call short, I didn't wait to hear his objections. Though he tried reaching out several times afterward, I steadfastly ignored his attempts, leading to his eventual silence. This brief respite was shattered the next morning, as my phone incessantly rang from 8 a.m. Answering the call, James immediately vented his frustrations about being unable to withdraw money from what he assumed was a joint bank account. Given that joint account holders typically have equal access, his difficulty puzzled me until I realized he might be attempting to access my personal account. Upon inquiry, James confirmed his intentions to withdraw from my account, igniting a tirade filled with irrational demands. James's outrage was unbridled, yet he failed to grasp the precautions I had taken the day before my hospitalization. Anticipating potential financial recklessness on his part, I had informed the bank to freeze any withdrawals until I could oversee them myself upon discharge. This precaution was vindicated by James's current actions attempting to withdraw funds from an account that, especially in light of our impending divorce, he had no right to access. Despite this, James saw no issue with his request and pressed me for an immediate withdrawal. I firmly reminded him that, in our current state, we were essentially strangers, and I was under no obligation to dispense money to someone who had effectively become an outsider to me. This newfound defiance took James aback, as he was unaccused James to me asserting myself in such a manner. His demands continued, now insisting on receiving money and compensation for the household duties I could not perform from the hospital. It was clear that, despite his educational background, James lacked the basic understanding and respect for our situation after 19 years of marriage. I addressed James with the patience one might use for a child, clarifying that I was no longer the passive partner he was used to manipulating. 
we would sort out the division of assets legally through a lawyer. His reaction was predictably angry, threatening to confront me in person at the hospital. Unperturbed, I had already taken measures to ensure my privacy and safety, instructing the nursing staff to admit no one but my parents to my room. True to his word, James did attempt to visit, only to be halted at the nurse's station, as evidenced by the continuous ringing and subsequent flood of messages on my phone. This barrier further illustrated the decisive steps I had taken towards independence and self-respect, standing firm against James's unreasonable expectations and intrusions. I archived all the messages James sent as proof and promptly reached out to my lawyer. It wasn't long before my attorney contacted James, which effectively halted the onslaught of messages. Just as I began to think the ordeal was nearing its end, a surprising turn of events unfolded. I was notified about a visitor, Lisa, a long-standing friend with whom I shared a passion for food. We used to explore dining spots together until my marriage. She reached out, expressing concern for my well-being and dropped a bombshell. She suspected Hannah, the young woman seen with James, was involved in an affair with my husband. My shock deepened when I learned of Lisa's connection to Hannah. She was Lisa's niece. The revelation came about because Hannah had boasted to her family about marrying a 51-year-old man, and a shared photograph revealed that man to be James. The twist that Lisa was inadvertently linked to this messy situation through family ties left me astounded. Lisa had already briefed her sister, Hannah's mother, about the upheaval their niece had stirred in my life. She was contemplating seeking reparation from Hannah for the distress caused but reassured me that our friendship, spanning two decades, wouldn't be sacrificed over this incident. Lisa had arranged a meeting to resolve the matter and invited me to join, offering to provide photographic evidence of the affair. After my hospital discharge, I headed to a secluded dining room in a restaurant with my lawyer, where James and Hannah were indulging in a lavish meal. Their brazenness caught me off guard. James had the audacity to suggest I foot their extravagant bill, but I firmly declined, asserting they covered their own expenses. My primary goal was to negotiate the division of our shared assets. Ignoring James's disparaging remarks, my lawyer and I settled in and laid out the evidence of James's wrongdoing. We presented legal documents delineating James's liability and the proposed division of property, alongside photos Lisa had taken, capturing James and Hannah's intimate moments and Hannah with another man at a hotel. This evidence visibly unsettled both James and Hannah, disrupting their meal. Lisa's timely entrance further escalated the tension. She confessed to capturing the incriminating photos, leaving Hannah bewildered by her aunt's involvement. Lissa then took the opportunity to clarify her actions, emphasizing the importance of accountability and the consequences of Hannah's choices, all while supporting me through this tumultuous chapter. Her intervention not only reinforced our bond, but also underscored the complexities of personal relationships intertwined with familial connections. Lisa, amidst the unfolding drama, assured me of her continued friendship, despite her intent to seek reparations from Hannah. She condemned Hannah's behavior as reprehensible, especially after Hannah falsely claimed to be pregnant. When confronted, Hannah looked visibly unpregnant, leaving everyone, including James, astounded by her claim. It wasn't long before she confessed to fabricating the pregnancy tale, admitting her strategy involved targeting affluent older men, with James unfortunately ensnared by her deceit. She hoped the lie would prompt James to leave me, but with the truth out, James was at a loss for words, especially when faced with his financial incapacity to address the situation. Lisa resolved to have Hannah apologize properly later and escorted her niece away, leaving James and me to a tense conversation. James, now grappling with the fallout, attempted to salvage our relationship, suggesting a fresh start. He argued that my lack of recent employment history would hinder my independence, 
to which I confidently responded that my financial stability was assured, thanks to my significant personal savings, excluding him from any claim to it. This revelation, along with my intent to proceed with the divorce, underscored my independence and the end of our nearly three-decade-long marriage. In the aftermath, Hannah made a monetary apology transferred directly to my account, an action enforced by her mother, who also mandated her employment to amass the owed compensation. James, alienated by his actions and the subsequent familial backlash, found himself financially strained, necessitating loans to fulfill his obligations towards me. His professional life suffered as well, with his indiscretion leading to job loss and a new, challenging chapter involving multiple jobs to manage his debts. With the compensation received, I directed a portion towards charitable causes and relocated to the countryside, investing the rest in a serene and fulfilling single lifestyle. My bond with Lisa remained strong. We embraced our singleness, planning to cohabit, explore culinary delights, and embark on leisurely journeys together. Our shared excitement for a future filled with friendship, food, and travel marked a hopeful chapter, ready to commence with the upcoming move. I looked forward to a life of joy and authenticity, free from the shadows of the past.